for listening to WCAT Radio, your home for authentic Catholic programming. Welcome to WCAT. I'm Kiki Latimer, and I'm your host for the Catholic Bookworm. Uh, happy to have with me today Frank Ravinelli. Welcome, Frank. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Author of a very cool um, adventure fantasy book called Pages of the Adair. Yep. Journey to Penit. Say it for me. Pen- yep, it's Penitia Throne. Journey to Penitia Throne. Throne. I knew I'd get that. That's yep. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Thank you for having me again. How about you start us off with a brief prayer? Of course. So I just got back from my pilgrimage uh, from Lourdes. So I always like praying to the Lady of Lourdes. So um, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed are thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady of Lords, pray for us. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. So how'd you wind up in Lords? So it was a really interesting story. So my, my brother was in the seminary for one year, and he met his best friend there. And his best friend was just ordained a priest last year and he was going and he posted on Facebook. So I I immediately signed up. And when I signed up, the trip got canceled and I got transferred to a new parish from Baton Rouge and I didn't want to cancel my trip. So I still went. And to be honest, it was the most amazing experience in my life. I felt like I'm just almost like I'm way more connected to my faith now after going there. It's one of the most beautiful places I've ever been to the entire world. So did you travel by yourself? So I originally, I did meet up with a parish there, but I did travel from Cleveland, Ohio to France by myself. Yes. So you live in Cleveland? Yep. I live a little bit south of Cleveland. It's in Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio. So it's about 35, 45 minutes away from Cleveland. It's like south, I would say southeast. Okay. Um, Tell us a little bit about yourself. You're an author. (laughs) Tell us. Tell us more. Yeah, so um, I come from a really big family. So I actually have five brothers. I have two dogs, and they're both boys. <laughs> so I grew up in uh, Northeast Ohio, and I got, I had a I'm very close with my brothers. I actually live with my older brother at the moment. Um, I went to the University of Akron, where I actually majored in marketing and business. Uh, I work in a kind of a financial role for my full time job, but I also do writing on the side. So uh, I recently had this passion for writing. I wouldn't say recently, but my entire life, I always wanted to develop a story, even when I was younger. So uh, I'm very, very adventurous. I love traveling and I'm a very family person. I I love being with my brothers and uh, playing competitive sports, even though sometimes I think I beat them in certain sports. (laughs) But yeah, that's pretty much about me. Don't quit your day job too soon, I tell (laughs) (laughs) authors. I loved your book. Um, um, I read it over the last couple of days. Um, tell, you want to tell us a little bit about it just to start us off? Maybe show us the cover. Which can- Oh, yeah, for sure. So here is the cover, pages of the... Uh, it's really cool. It has a diamond 3D on it. I love the design. I had a great graphic designer. Um, so, and there's the back of it, too. It has a little... Who was your designer? So it was actually a funny story. So I moved to Charlotte, North Carolina last year, and I met a coworker that was so talented with graphic design, and he always wanted to take on side projects after work. And one day I was trying to find a graphic designer, which was kind of a struggle at first. And then I messaged him and he said he would love to take on the project. I gave him a couple of clips of my book and he created the first round and I absolutely loved it, displayed exactly what I needed. So uh, I... I still have him doing side projects for me, but he I think he did an amazing job on it. Does he want his name out there on social media? Uh, I don't know yet, <laughs> but I'm definitely going to contact him soon if he does. All right. Cool. Cool. Yeah. So tell us about this mystical land that you bring us into. Yeah. So it it's a land called the Realm of Inrealm. So it's on the planet uh, of Erdina. So there's two continents. There's uh, Inrealm and Jagoria. So it, basically, the land right now is plagued in darkness. It's ruled by the Dark Lord Volok. And right now, basically, he uh, controls both Inrealm and Jagoria. But 
when God first created, and my God's name, Aminya, when he created the land, he prophesied in the constellations a foretold hero that would be sent down, born of an unnatural birth, to kind of eradicate evil from the land. So it's really about a story about a prophesied individual that is destined to kind of almost defeat the Dark Lord Volok. So obviously we have flavors of your Catholicism. Yes. That are, that are here. Um, so how does, tell us a little bit about how that affects how you write. Because you've got these realms, obviously, of good and evil. Mm -hmm. Very clearly distinguished, unlike sort of Harry Potter, where good and me evil sort of get all intermingled and mixed up. Um, you have this, this clear distinction. Yeah, and it really did fuel my writing because understanding there's, so, there's a lot of evil out in the world. And I really want, and I think certain novels kind of, they kind of lack this part of it. I always make it that the good side is so much more powerful than the evil. There is evil out there, but when you trust in our faith and in God, you're always going to triumph over the evil. And that really helped me write because I really wanted to write about, I did write about aspects of evil that are really relevant today because evil today is not so much, oh, I'm going to conquer the land. Evil today is trying to almost eradicate the Christians. It's really not, it's like really just not good. And that's what I kind of wrote about. And it kind of fueled my writing. Very early on, you make a comment about, um, where do I have it here? That very often the, are, the stories are sort of dismissed as myth, which I found very interesting. Um, you know, many people today just dismiss the Christian story as myth. Um, yeah. It's, you know, it's just a made up story. It's just pretend and, and that myth doesn't matter in any way. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So the beginning the of. Line. Yeah, that is a very interesting. Yeah. When I first started writing the prologue of the story, there, there were the first creation where uh, 10 women that ruled the land and throughout time. Uh, their teachings and their, uh, their, their ruling was actually considered myth because people just didn't believe it anymore. When the kings and the queens started ruling the land, they kind of just said, okay, we're the ones that created the law of the land. The women back then were no longer a thing. That was just all just kind of a conspiracy theory. And I really wanted to keep that relevant in my story. I also like it at very early, I think it's in chapter four, you say, um, sort of set forth in time, clarity will come. And, and I like that idea that, you know, very often when we set out, I mean, the journey of our life, but also um, smaller journeys that we embark on, your journey to Lourdes, um, you know, often when we start out, things are kind of murky and we're not quite sure how it's going to work out. And like you probably thought at some point, should I really go to Lourdes on, you know, if the trip was canceled, maybe that's a sign, but you, you head out. But we have this this thing with grace, I think, that in time, clarity will come. Mm -hmm. that the Lord does work with us in time. Yeah. And I think that's really relevant to my life, too, is at first, you're just kind of like, sometimes you can be confused. It's like, why do I not know my greater purpose? And my characters feel like that, too. They don't truly understand what their what their life will become. And in time, they will have that clarity. They will go on these adventures. They will discover things about themselves, maybe forge friendships that will really enhance and maybe have them have a better understanding of what their purpose is. And that's something that I myself has experienced, too, as a writer. I didn't really know. I was kind of confused at times. Well, what should I do in my life? And then in time, the more experiences I went through, I understood that my purpose is all God's. It's all part of God's plan. And that's really what my characters go through too at first they're very hesitant but now when they experience the adventure they kind of get this clarity and sometimes that clarity comes through a great deal of pain and destruction in your story. yeah yeah and in our lives <laughs> yeah definitely i i totally agree you have a, a a um a statement i think it's here in chapter 11 where you say embrace every moment as an opportunity to grow a beautiful line. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's actually my favorite line in the entire story, because there are times that I feel like too there are, when you don't really know 
why you're in a certain situation or you're going through a struggle. And this can be through work, through your friendships, personal life, that you don't understand maybe why you're going through some kind of suffering. And I think this is when you grow the most internally, when you're going through this suffering, maybe when you're in an uncomfortable situation, uh, you're really growing internally. And that's what my character said to the main character. It's embracing the journey, understanding that you're only going to grow stronger when you adventure out. Uh, and I really, that's actually my favorite line in the whole book, because it's so relevant, I think, to everybody's story in life. Um, just before that, I have here, you you wrote, um, and I found, I, this was one of my, that was that, these two together. Every moment you resist the temptation to go back to the ordinary is the moment you are advancing your inner self to the utmost. Face the unknown with eagerness. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that one because it's more so I, how I picture this line is it reminds me of times when people are very hesitant about maybe moving out, like like moving into different areas in, in the country. For myself, it was when I was, I lived in Northeast Ohio and I had an opportunity in Charlotte, North Carolina. I, I was really, I, I didn't want to stay in Cuyahoga Falls, but I was very scared about moving. And it's, this is what the characters kind of experience too. They, they want to stay in their ordinary lives, but they understand when they get out, that's is when they're going to enhance their inner selves the most, when they make these friendships with people they've never met before. So I, I really like that line because it's very similar to what I notice a lot of my friends go through too. They don't want to, they're scared. To, they might be a little hesitant about making that next move. And, and, and it's almost a temptation to stay in the ordinary. But when you get out, you can experience extraordinary things. Especially if you're really working with prudence and discernment, um, you're going to the sacraments for grace to kind of give you that guidance. Because obviously, I mean, we don't want to venture into a, the wrong unknown. Yeah, you know? so exactly. We're, so we're looking for, you know, okay, which unknown should I head to? I remember years ago I had visited um, Holy Apostles College and Seminary in Cromwell, Connecticut, and it was it was just wonderful. And it was about an hour and 15 minutes from where I live. And when I got home, I thought, you know, oh, I'd love to work there, you know, just mm -hmm. even part time. It, it, that would be a really cool place to work. And um, I said, you know, I wish I, I I wish I had the nerve to just write to the rector and say, you know, how would you like me to work there part time? But that was like a really scary thing to do. Just out of the blue. He'd met me over lunch and and a friend said to me, well, what have you got to lose, you know, by, you know, sending a letter sort of into the unknown? Like, what have you got to lose? So I was like, right, what am I really, you know, just be brave and do it. So I, I sent that email and um, the rector responded, we'd love to have you here part time. Oh, that's amazing. You know, two, one or two days a week. And, and that developed into six years there that were just amazing. Um, like you're saying, I met wonderful people, made friends, lifetime friends, and uh, Sebastian being one of them. And uh, so this this came out of that. Um, and so I couldn't foresee any of that. It was just really, really scary at first. To yeah. Take that first step. Yeah. yeah, the first step can be very, very challenging. And that's such a beautiful story because, yeah, it was all part of God's plan. And uh, you, if you didn't write that email, you wouldn't have maybe made those friendships. So if, if you don't embrace the journey, you might not really, that's what I mean by enhancing your inner self to the fullest, is you're going to meet so many wonderful people by making that initial step like you did. Right. And and it's amazing how then the path, different pathways, as in your story, different pathways open up, different doors appear um, that you don't expect to walk through. Um, for my first year at Holy Apostles, I stayed um, sort of across the street in one of the dorm, sort of um, sort of like a visiting house kind of area. So I had my own space, which I liked. And then one day somebody came to me and said, yeah, we're not letting you stay over there anymore. We've decided to move you two miles down the road. You're going to be staying with this elderly couple. Barbara and Andy O'Keefe. And I was like, oh, man, this is the worst. You know, I have all my space right across the street from where I'm teaching. Um, I was totally annoyed and totally aggravated with the whole idea. Um, but Sister Mary, you know, the next thing I knew I was being shipped off. Barbara and Andy picked me up, this elderly couple in their 80s, pick me up, take me to their beautiful home on the Connecticut River, hand me the key to the door the first night they meet me 
Andrew was this amazing Catholic lawyer. He'd been a lawyer for like 60 years. Um, and so for the next five years, I stayed with them and their little dog, Mitzi. And I consider Barbara and Andy like two of the greatest gifts of my entire life. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. The time with them was like amazing, amazing. They were just these devout Catholics. He'd been, he had stories that would, you know, curl your ears. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, I became almost like the daughter, a daughter to them. And um, it was an amazingly beautiful love friendship that developed. Um, but me, I didn't want to go into that unknown at all. <laughs> yeah. Like, no, no. <laughs> I know it's scary at first. You're like, oh, I don't know if this is the right choice. And then look how that worked out for you is that you created amazing friendships. So it is the first part of it's very hard about going into the unknown. But then you, you realize it's part of God's plan. It's just so beautiful at the end. It's amazing what God does have planned. And, and you see that develop in your book um, for your characters. You know, they're, they're really venturing out of their comfort zone. Um, they are going into what feels like, you know, dangerous territory. Um, you've got these creatures that arrive. What are they called? Gaidens? They're the Geodons. Geodons. Okay. Yeah. And you said that I was kid. They're sort of related to the orcs. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which I love that you tapped into the Lord of the Rings with that. Yes, I have. Yeah. Priceless is like, oh, we know about them. Yeah. <laughs> Geodons? It's the Geodons. Geodons. Geodons, yeah. These are like really nasty creatures. Yeah, and the, the, the sad part is they used to be peaceful too. They're, my imagery there is fallen angels. So the Geodons, so there are certain orcs, and I, I kind of read into fantasy a lot. There's certain orcs are peaceful. And uh, and when the Geodons kind of, they, they went down a bad path, they kind of revolted against the the Kordak, which is the early women that ruled the land. And then they were kind of almost like deformed in a way that they just kind of revolted against the way of life. And, and they're really... Uh, they're now they're just kind of like monstrous creatures that that all they do is hate. And that's what I I really wanted to, to embrace the idea of fallen angels with that. Well, you did a good job. Of it. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> they're, they're quite they're quite horrible. Yeah, they're pretty scary. There's times in that book where I was a little bit scared writing it. <laughs> One of the, the themes that I you you mentioned quite a bit throughout the book is the concept of stress. And um, at one point you say stress is not sacred. Do not stress. Yeah. And I really like this because I, I do my daily rosary. And when you're under stress or anxiety, you have to understand that that's not coming from God. And I, when I'm stressful, I just, it's like a, it's like a suffering almost that I need to offer up. Cause I understand this is not from God and ex these anxieties. So I, I really put that in the book because I want my characters, when they're undergoing stress, they have to understand that if you just trust yourself into Mary, into Jesus, uh, all this stress can, all this suffering can be offered up. And that's what I really, I really wrote about that in the novel. So speaking of Mary, since you brought us to Mary, so you introduce us to Mary um, very sweetly I, I, through the... Um, the character of Queen Eliza. Yes, yeah. my favorite character. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so I, I, it's funny because this is a very um, amazing story. And I, I, I remember writing this chapter the exact day, the exact moment. So I was really in tune with the sacraments. I was going to confession. I was attending mass. Um, and I, I really was kind of on writer's block, actually. And then one day I was writing the chapter and I, she was not even supposed to be in this novel. And then I started writing. And then I was really praying to Mary. I said, help me guide this book. Help me come up with these creative ideas. And then I noticed when I started introducing this queen, it was her. I was writing about her. And every single interaction was just like, okay, this is the Virgin Mary. And it's very similar to what I think J.R.R. Tolkien was actually aiming for when he wrote about uh, Lady Galadriel in The Lord of the Rings. So um, she's my favorite character because uh, I, I really write about how evil is so terrified of her. They won't even mention her name in the book. So I, I really made her a powerful character, and she is the most powerful character in my novel. Um, 
at the, towards the end. I mean, I don't want to discuss the actual story too much because I don't want any spoilers here. Yeah. But, um, you know, towards the end when they um, they tap, you know, that your main character has to, you know, is in a bad situation and realizes that, you know, it's now or never to tap into the power of Mary um, and that she's given him, that grace that she's specifically given to him. Um, I, I was reminded of how Mary is often called the um, Terror of Demons. Yes. That title, Terror of Demons. And if you look up that title of her, um, there's some really, like, downright, almost nasty depictions of Mary of being like, ah. You know, yeah. You know. um, I gave a talk at a conversation. A confirmation talk several years back, and I referred to Mary as badass. Yeah, inviting me back. Yeah. <laughs> she is. <laughs> but um, you know, I said, you know, we had this sort of always these demure pictures, you know, statues of Mary. I said, but Mary's considered the terror of demons. Um, she's badass. Yeah, she's got grace that can really kick butt, mm -hmm. and um. That really comes out in your story um, that, you know, there's power there when we tap into the mother of God. Definitely. And that's what my characters really see is when they're ongoing, undergoing that stress, like in that particular part. And it's really relevant in my life, too. When I was undergoing stuff that was was not godly, when I was going through stress, uh, anxiety, um, I just pray to Mary and she just whatever thing was bothering me she immediately helps alleviate it. She is so powerful. And the evil in my book is so unbelievably terrified of her. And you'll, met, I don't really want to give anything away, but uh, they're even afraid to sometimes even say her name. I don't think they will even say her name because they're so terrified of her. And that's what I really want to portray in this novel. Because like you said, uh, she's awesome. And uh, it may be in most stories, it just shows how beautiful she is. But I wanted to show how evil is so scared of her. Um, in chapter 17, you really bring out concepts of, of our free will that, you know, within your story, um, you say everyone in Erdina, which to yep. us would be here, Earth, um, has a choice that we, you know, we have a choice between good and evil. Mm -hmm. um, and your characters are making that choice. Um, and we are as well. Yeah, definitely. And some of my characters, they're, they're almost very tempted to abandon the journey. It's like, why, why do I have to go on this journey? Uh, maybe I can just live a quiet life and, and not maybe discover my, my destiny. And that's something that I feel like we go through. Sometimes we can, we experience life that we might want to go down the easy route or maybe the route that is not, not of God. And that's where it, we can very easily fall into sin. And uh, I, I think that's, that's very relevant in my book is that they're very tempted to maybe go into that route, but they understand that their greater purpose and the God's plan, which God in my book, his name is Aminya. Aminya's plan is, is beyond their own. And I really wanted to, to emphasize that in my novel. Yeah. I mean, sometimes we even sort of sense, well, I know what the right thing to do is, but it's, I don't really want to do that. Yeah. You know? I mean, sometimes the right thing to do is really the hardest thing to do. Yeah, I totally agree. And it's like even the saints, the saints all underwent uh, a lot of suffering. And you're, it, it, when you're going to do the right thing, you are, you might experience a lot of suffering, but, but it is the right route to go through it. If you're, uh, if you're listening to God and um, going through his plan. During the pandemic, I took care of a, a, a good friend of mine who was, was a very elderly. She was blind and mentally ill. And, and could be extremely horrible to deal with. Um, and I was kind of the last person left standing who would still deal with her. Um, and she had gone blind. And, um, you know, I, occasionally, I mean, it was, it was horrible. I mean, this was a woman who, until we got her meds right, would call like 40 times a day, 40, 50 phone calls a day, screaming oh, wow. and yelling and angry and, and disoriented and and. Before I got her into an assisted living, a uh, half an hour from me, she lived like an hour from me. So I was back and forth two or three times. And it was it was exhausting. Um, and she wasn't always overly grateful. I mean, there was a lot of screaming before the grateful came. And, <laughs> um, at one point, you know, there were people who said to me, like, why are you doing this? Like, why mm -hmm. are you bothering? <laughs> She's horrible. 
Um, and I was, there was just that deep, deep inner understanding. It's me or nobody. And if I put her into a nursing home, they'll, they'll just sedate her and kill her off. There was yeah. no one who put up with this behavior. And um, it was just the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. you, just, you just had that inner grace and knowledge. It's the right thing to do. Um, yeah. So I did it. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's so beautiful. In the end, it was a deep blessing. Mm -hmm. But um, there were days where, you know, I was just, I used to have really long hair and I pulled it all out. <laughs> <laughs> But, um, yeah, sometimes we just know what the right thing to do is, but it's going to be really hard and miserable. And, yeah. But the grace comes. Yep. So. <laughs> oh. I totally agree. You're going to go down challenges in your life like you, like you did there, taking care of her, that, that it is the right thing to do, but the grace you receive is just, it's just amazing. Uh, I, was like, I was hesitant about going on a pilgrimage with people I didn't know. And I, it was something I was like, eh, maybe I – Maybe I won't go. I, I can get my money back. <laughs> but then I understood when I was there, that was the right thing to do. And it brought my, not only myself closer to God, it brought my entire family. I can see the graces pouring out from this trip. So it's just amazing that like your story right there, it's just like, you didn't know and that was your free will. And that was you listening to God that you understood that that was the right thing to do. And the grace you received from it is just amazing. It's, it's pretty cool. You know, that is that whole thing. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard what God has prepared um, for those who love him. And we really can't. It's very difficult to see ahead very far um, and to see what the plan is. But there there is a good plan for each of us. Um, that unfolds in your book. Um, you know, people meeting up with other people, moving forward, um, danger being averted. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I think it's uh, really relevant in my book because uh, they meet up with so many different personalities. And at first, I mean, you can see there's a lot of con conflict. They don't really, uh, some personalities don't mix together. I think you notice in those in the characters in Lewis and Lias, they're, they're brothers, but two distinct personalities. But they understand that uh, uh, Lewis can, has just such an innocence to him where Lias is more, I don't want to be on this journey, but it almost is like the perfect combo because they, they complement each other perfectly. Those names you chose, I mean, they're about light. Is there, yeah. Yeah, uh, Lewis and, Lea, uh, Lewis and yeah. Leox, yeah. yeah. So they're, actually, it's funny because they're named after my younger brothers. <laughs> oh, interesting. Yeah, so they're very much, uh, I really took their personalities and kind of uh, molded them into the book. And I love the names too. I was uh, at first. I was when I was coming up with names. Uh, I just started really, just like, really trying to uh, create something unique. And I really like those two because I think it was a perfect brother combo. And uh, they're very funny. They're they're uh, they're my. Uh, I really enjoy reading about them. <laughs> yeah, there is quite a bit of humor in your book. Some in the conversations at times. Yes. <laughs> yes, I agree. There are times when. They don't, especially when they're undergoing stress, uh, through the stress, there might be something that is uh, maybe a joke that is said. I, and I kind of feel like that almost alleviates stress. When I'm under, under stress with my brothers or we're fighting, uh, someone might say a joke or do something funny. And it always kind of alleviates stress. Understand that, okay, it's not that big of a deal what we're going through. So I really want to pinpoint that in my book too. When my mother was dying, um some 20 years ago, but my brother and sister and I, we spent a week at the hospital, you know, sort of sleeping in the, the waiting room of the ICU. And, you know, it was, it was very stressful. Um, and she was dying. Um, so it wasn't happy. And um, she, um, we used humor to get through that. I mean, we just laughed our heads off through the whole week. And that was <laughs> how we got through the stress, you know, and um, there was just really sweet ways in which we'd see, like, God sort of, um, you know, just honor the humor that was there in the family and the closeness between the siblings um, in this very stressful and difficult time. It was, it was really fun, um, strangely, um, to spend that time together. Um, but we did. We tapped into our humor to deal with the stress. Yeah. Yeah. And I think... <laughs> 
it was the week before it was a week two weeks before christmas and at the end of the week i had to go home to get ready for christmas my mom actually died on christmas morning which was beautiful because christmas was her favorite day of the year Um, but just before i left we'd been there a week and we'd been going up and down you know in the elevator a lot which sometimes would put your equilibrium off after you're in elevators like all day long for five or six days and there was (laughs) there was the icu wing was like over here and the children's icu wing was down here and in between was a nurse's station and my sister and I were at the nurse's station, and I looked down the children's wing, and I saw this giant animal cross from one room to another. And I was really startled. In my oh, sister. my goodness. What's wrong? <laughs> and I said, I must be losing it, but I just saw a moose. <laughs> and then my sister looked at me, and she said, a moose? You know, we're on the fifth floor of the hospital. And I said, <laughs> upstate New York and I said I swear to God I just saw a moose and she said you know sort of like okay now your humor is just like gone over the top and this is ridiculous what do you mean you just saw a moose cross the corridor (laughs) and and now the nurse at the nursing station kind of was catching hold of this and she's like what did you see and I said I swear to God at the end of the children's wing I just saw a moose and she said oh that's not a moose that's Rudolph the red-nosed reindeer <laughs> oh my gosh that's a good one <laughs> there was this, gi- this guy in this giant reindeer outfit who had crossed the hall that is I, hilarious I turned to my sister and I was like I told you I saw a moose <laughs> yeah I bet I would probably make that mistake too. That I could definitely see that being a moose, especially I saw a giant distance. brown four-legged animal across. <laughs> that is too funny. <laughs> so we had, you know, despite the fact that we were in a very painful and difficult situation, um, we had a beautiful week with my mom and the three of us, you know, sleeping on the waiting room floor um, and and making the best of a difficult situation. And your characters do that, you know, they're, you're, I, again, I don't want to, you know, the spoilers, I don't want to say too much, it's a wonderful story, um, but you do place them in a lot of very difficult situations and sad situations. Mm-hmm. Um, I, at first I thought, well, this is kind of a children's book, like younger teens, but there's a lot of death in your book. Um, what age group would you recommend the book for? wanted to ask you about yeah so that's a really good question at first i was going to write more of like a like a chronicles of narnia audience like a little bit younger uh children's book but then i i really didn't want to do that because i i wanted to write there is life in these stories there is going to be tragic events and there is going to be violence i mean this is set with sword fighting uh going on so it's not going to be uh there's going to be violence in it so i would say my age group is probably late high school. It's really in college. So like 18 through, I mean, 18 through 20, 25, 30. So it's really around that age group. Um, I, it, there is parts in it that I wouldn't be comfortable with children reading because it is really violent. Um, so I really want to aim for the college audience. And that's right now my marketing plan is to aim to uh, college students, especially Christian students. Mm-hmm. Just wanted to mention it. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about um, later on in the book, I think it's p- chapter 21. Your name, Ari, Ari, Uriel? I yep, Uriel. Uriel. Uriel goes into anger. And I found it very interesting that as soon as he goes into anger, he loses hope and goes into despair. Yes. I found it very interesting that you link those two things. Um, and talk yeah. About that. Yeah. So when he's going through that anger, because he's experiencing so much pain in that chapter and he almost, when he's going through this, he just doesn't have any hope anymore. He's like, I, my life's not working out like it should be. And that's very relevant in everybody's life. When they're going through this immense anger, they're like, this isn't working out like I want it to be. This is, this is sad. Like, I, I don't know what is going on anymore. And that's what he's going through because he's experiencing so much pain at that moment that he just loses all hope. Nothing's going as planned. Uh, his whole entire journey almost feels like for nothing to him. And it's there that he hears, you know, he really starts to like hear the the Dark Lord. He really starts to hear Lord Volok saying, you know, 
you know, uh, and the other guy who's in cahoots with them. I don't want to mention names too much because yeah. I don't want to ruin your story. But, you know, sort of the idea of end your, end your worthless life. You're, you're, you're not who you thought you were. You don't have the power of God with you that you thought you had. Um, you know, nobody really cares about you. Your family doesn't. Your friends don't. You really don't have anybody who truly loves you. Like, you're worthless. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, give up. Um, that yeah. was, that's interesting that that's, you know, when you go into despair, when you go into anger and despair, that's when you can hear the bad messages <laughs> in your life. Yeah, it's it's very that's a very powerful chapter that I wrote. And I really like that chapter because it's very linked to uh, when people go through like immense depression. It's they think they're worthless. They almost don't even know what they're going through and they, they don't know what the purpose of it is. And that's when you can get it can get very dangerous because that's when you're almost listening to uh, uh, demons and Satan almost telling you you're not worth it. And that's what my character kind of goes through in that part. There was a line later on. I want to go back because that's when he 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 remembers to tap into the the power of Lady Eliza. You know, that's that's, you know, what his his lifeline is. But uh, shortly I will come back to that. But you say refuse to engage in any communication with the enemy. Yes. Yeah. So I like that because if you are going through that and then and you feel like you're hearing like like you feel like everything's coming at you, that is not of God's that is not from God. That is from that is going to be from demonic activity that can be from Satan and you do not engage with the enemy. And that's what I like about it. If you hear this, you just immediately you turn to God and say, and I myself, if ever I hear I feel anxiety or any of that, I turn to uh, Mary and, and St. Joseph. St. Joseph is actually a terror of demons, too. So I really want to make that in there because you, you pray to them. You do not listen to these outside forces that are that are basically telling you that you're nothing. Uh, and I really like that because you never want to engage with the enemy. And I, uh, that's why I kind of wrote about that. I mean, we live in a society that messes around, obviously, with tarot cards and Ouija boards and, you know, all kinds of stuff connected to a cult and the darkness. Um, yeah. And, and so I thought that's a, that line, refuse to engage in any communication with the enemy. Like, don't even go there. Yeah. Um, but like you say, also those little... You know, sometimes Satan's much more is much quieter than that. Those, mm -hmm. those little tiny messages that get whispered. You, you you can't do this. Don't you know? You're you're not good enough to give that talk. Somebody just this morning was thinking about being an altar server, a, a, a gentleman, a, an adult. You know, said I, I said I hear you're thinking about being an altar server, and he said, eh, yeah, but you know, I, I I was when I was a kid, and I messed up once. And, you know, I'm afraid I might, what if I mess up again? And I said, well, what if you do? Like, so what? You know, <laughs> that's yeah. what you want. But you could hear that little tiny message that was coming through, you know, you might not be good enough. Yeah. And, and we all are, we all have that. I mean, it's, it's scary. It's, it's, I mean, you know, this is one of your first interviews. It's scary to think about doing an interview, right? Yeah. Put yourself out there with your books. Um those are scary things to do, but um, we are protected when we do what we've, you know, really discerned is the right thing to do. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's a great point because I, I was scared at first to even write. Uh, I was at first even thinking about doing a pen name. I was just so scared about putting my name out there. It's uh, when you write a novel, it's you're really marketing yourself and your name and your face. And that was something that like those tiny voices, like you, you even heard, like it just, it was there, but then I really listened to God there and said, no, this is meant to be. I have to write. I have to put my name out there. And that's what uh, I think people go through is they just, they kind of almost have doubt in themselves. They hear these voices and they're like, yeah, hey, maybe I'm not the person to do this. Maybe I don't have the skills. Uh, and that's when you just got to say to step aside. And I like to say, tell that temptation to step aside and embrace God's, uh, God's purpose and God's plan for you. I mean, I hear my friend saying, what have you got to lose? You know, yeah, like, I love that. <laughs> well, it's like my, you know, like my reputation, my self-esteem, <laughs> you know, the little shred of it that's left. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. 
you know, and, and, you know, I think we do, we don't realize how powerful grace is. Mm -hmm. And especially, you know, like, you know, staying close to the sacraments, you know, especially the Eucharist and, and confession gives us, you know, constant um, recourse to that grace. Yeah, I agree. I think, yeah, I think that's a very good example because I was talking to my little brother the other day about how powerful confession is. I go to confession. I try to almost every three weeks, every month. And I, I just noticed that you almost feel before you go into confession, you almost feel like weighed down. I feel like when I'm in a state of sin, I feel like weighed down. I feel like something is wrong. When I get out of confession, it, I feel lighter. I just feel so amazing after confession. And I feel like that's the grace and that's, that's all the, the sin just gone from my life. So I, I think that staying in tune with the sacraments is really just such an amazing thing. And it can really transform your life like it has transformed mine. Most of my life, I've gone to confession, you know, every three or six months or so. But just recently, I've started going weekly um, with the purpose of really working on some particular things in my life um, and to be able to see them more clearly. And it's amazing how it's helped. It's it's really helped me to focus on. Um, and it's interesting, not so much sins of commission, but sins of omission, mm -hmm. um, things that I don't do that I ought to do. Yeah, um, and that's been really interesting um, in my life um, to just get that extra grace and 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 that clarity. You know, that in time clarity comes um, that God works with us in time. Um, so that's been that's been wonderful. Going back here, um, you know, in this yeah. in this despair um, that your main character goes into, um, he's he's you know ready to kind of like give it all up. He, he remembers those those words in darkest times. Remember Lady Eliza. Yeah, that that Mary, Marian voice. Yeah. And that part is so amazing because he is just like I said, he is at the lowest. He can't get any lower at that point. He feels like even his friends, he feels like are not his friends anymore. And that's when he understands, OK, he th and that's when almost like God is with him. Mary is with him. And he remembers that conversation he had with one of his friends. I won't say who it is. And he knows that she is the one to fight this evil with him. She is going to fight this evil with him. And that's when he, when he understands that, okay, this enemy has no chance against me when I have Mary, God, and Jesus on my side. So I really love that part of the book because you see so many people that might not, they th they're in that point of their life. They don't think that their life matters. They think that, I don't have any friend. I don't have support, but really they have the best support in the entire universe. They have Jesus, Mary, they have everything. So uh, that part is, uh, that part was, to be honest, that part was my, probably the hardest part of the book to write. Cause I think it's just so relevant and it's, it's very powerful religiously. I mentioned earlier, I, I can't remember whether it was during the interview or when we spoke earlier, the idea that um, a lot of times in fantasy novels, it's the idea that good and evil are equal. They're equal yeah. forces. Um, we see that in Star Wars. You know, there's the good and the bad, but they're equal forces. Yeah. Um, but we, in Christianity, Catholicism, we understand that they're not equal forces. That the, the power of the good is 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 far greater than the evil. And, and this comes out in your book, the power of, of, of the lady, um, Eliza, is far greater than the dark power, even though the dark powers are much flashier in, in our lives. We see them much more easily in some circumstances. Um, like you're saying, we forget that we can call out for help. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a great point, because like you said, Star Wars, I mean, there are parts of it, like if you if you join the Sith, you're going to be more powerful than the good. And I don't particularly like that. And I, I wanted to, and like you said, it like the evil is more flashy. And that's kind of like life today. Uh, the evil side and the sinful side, it might seem more flashy. It might seem like you're getting a better life, but it's not at all. The good is always going to triumph it. And that's what I really wanted to key on in my story is even though the Dark Lord Volok might control the land, he has no power over the Queen Eliza. He has no power over Aminya, the god of the universe. So that's what I really like about the book is 
it might seem like the best route. Oh, I can join the dark side. I, I can gain all this materialistic stuff. I can, I can advance in life easier. But no, that's not the good side. That is the evil side. And it has no power uh, control over the good. So I, I really want to emphasize that in the book. Yeah, it comes out very well. I mean, and in our own lives, we, we sometimes forget, you know, Satan is a creature. He's, yeah. It's not like creator versus a cre different creator. Mm -hmm. um, you know, God, Lucifer, Satan is a, cre is a creature. You know, yeah. A powerful creature, but a creature nonetheless, an angel, but yeah. a creature. You know, and, and sometimes we lose sight of that. Yeah. Um, especially when we look around, I mean, our, at a, such a fallen world with fallen nature, um, with wars and, you know, devastation that we see. Um, it's it's easy sometimes to forget that, you know, good will throw, it has already thrown the last stone, you know, on Calvary. It's easy to forget that. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, the good has already won the battle. And that's what I like about my novel, too. It's only God can create. The evil side can't create anything. And I think that's something that uh, my evil side is very envious of. They can't create life. They can't create anything. They have no power like God does. God's the creator of everything. And I really like that, too, because it really emphasizes that. And what we see in Christianity, Satan can't do anything uh, where God is the ultimate creator. Um, so I really wanted to make that imagery tie into uh, our Christian beliefs. Towards the end, you know, we, we, we're, we've always been told, like, never look back. You know, Lot's wife is told, don't look back. You'll turn into a pillar of salt. And obviously that, you know, don't look back, you know, you know just regret and um, wanting something that's in the past because it will turn us into a pillar of salt. We'll just be weeping the rest of our lives. Yeah. You talk about looking back, the possibility of looking back with gratefulness and awareness of growth in our lives. Yeah, uh, that's a really, and that's something I really wanted to add because that is something I hear a lot is don't look back. But then I notice in my journey personally, every time I look back, I understand how much I have grown in faith and personally. And I always want to look back to say, okay, I don't want to be that person anymore. I love who I am today. And it really helps me kind of almost uh, grow in my faith when I, when I look back and say, I'm never going to go back to that point I was at. When I was going through suffering, when I was in a, a life of sin, I, I look back at that and say, wow, it's like, I will never let that happen again. And that's why I like that line, because you, you do almost sometimes want to look back to understand how much you have grown throughout time. So that's why I kind of referenced that in that book. Yeah, it's a good reference, because I think, I mean, gratefulness, gratitude is an antidote for so many things, it's an antidote for sadness um, mm -hmm. and for loss and um, for so many things. And gratefulness for the growth we've seen, even through the rotten things we've done, God right straight with our crooked lines. Yeah. You know, um, and being grateful for that. You know, God took something rotten that I did, but he managed to bring some good out of it despite myself, you know. Yeah. Um, and, and to be grateful for that. Um, and just being grateful that, you know, we, we, for every day, you know, because it is a gift, you know, our yeah. time is a gift. Um, I agree. Every time I look back, even at the pilgrimage, there's so much growth and I'm so grateful I went on that. It's, I was hesitant at first, like I said, but then looking back at it, I'm like, this was like the most uh, amazing experience in my life and the friendships I now have because of this. And now the graces that I'm receiving, it's just, I'm looking back at that. And all, I'm so grateful that I experienced it. Yeah. Years ago, oh gosh, maybe 20 or more years ago now, a good friend of mine who's a film director, he called me and uh, he was still just getting started. And he said, uh, Kiki, he said, I, I'm really, I got this weird question for you. Somebody's offered me a trip to Thailand. Oh, and wow. Were, like a two week trip to Thailand, he said. But like, I'm like really scared of the very idea of like going to Thailand for two years. It's like totally out of my comfort zone. And I was like, what are you crazy? <laughs> Just, <laughs> pack your bags, kid, you know, and off he went to Thailand for one of, you know, just an absolutely magical experience of his life. And I, I think he actually wound up working with people and, and doing film work through some of the contacts he made, um, but he, it was the journey of a lifetime. He said it was amazing. But, you know, again, you know, and, and he was a person who 
I wouldn't have expected to be afraid. Um, but he was, you know, he was, mm -hmm. he was still young, um, you know, just out of college, probably like 26, 27, somewhere around in there. Um, but the idea of a journey to Thailand, he didn't know, like your journey to Lourdes, he didn't know what was going to happen there. You know? Yeah. So, but he had yeah. a beautiful, beautiful trip. Yeah. Yeah. It's scary at first. And that trip to Thailand, I bet was, it was scary. To, I've never even been to Asia. So I, I can see that being a very scary, scary journey to embark on. But I think you, when you go, you just, you just can, you can see so much open up in your life. And I feel like you grow so much when you go on those journeys. So I always recommend people to go on adventures or travels like that because you really experience so much. I say just go. Um, yeah. The more you can see of other cultures, the more, the better you understand your own. Um, you know, the more you see how other people live. I mean, I've been to India, I've been to Haiti, I've been to Italy, I've been to quite a bit around the United States. Um, and I find the more you see how other people live, how other cultures are, um, even within the United States, we have different cultures going yeah. on. But the more you see that, the more you understand yourself, you meet people, you make friends um, with people you never dreamed you could meet, meet, be friends with. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen, I, I always mention the film here, The Railway Man, Colin Firth. So. If you haven't seen The Railway Man, see it. I'll have to um, check it out. It's really a, a film, it's a true story, and it's kind of a sleeper. Most people have no idea. I don't know why it didn't do well. It's one of my favorite films. But it really shows you what happens when you venture out of your comfort zone, um, how God can work with with that. And uh, yeah, so check out the railway man. <laughs> that sounds interesting. I love that theme too. It's like when you get, and we, we took a class not even for work. It's like, it's so beneficial to get out of your comfort zone because that's when you're out of your comfort zone, that's when growth is occurring. So I, I do love that theme. It's one of my favorite themes in life. Well, this is a story by man. It goes way out of his comfort zone. Oh, wow. <laughs> and how God uses it. Um, yeah. And it's a true story. So um, really um, amazing. Um, so I'll have to much check that one to out. talk about, but I don't want to. I don't want to spoil your story. Your story was delightful. I loved. I loved reading it, even though I had to read it very quickly in the last three or four days. Yeah. <laughs> but it. But it's. It's. It was a fun. Fun fantasy story combined with Catholicism. Um, so I loved it. Is there anything I know? We you sent me questions, and I have other things that when we could talk about but i don't want spoilers for people that are going to really enjoy the book is there anything you'd like to mention that we didn't get to that's really important to you about the book i would say that yes i would say that something that was very important to me about the book was i remember there was times when i first had this idea in college to write a book and i feel like when i started writing i didn't have the best creative ideas i was just kind of writing just random stuff that I that wasn't really, uh, to be honest, it wasn't very good. <laughs> but then I noticed the more, and I think we just briefly touched about it. We did actually touch about it, about getting out of your comfort zone. The more experiences I went through, the more places I traveled, the different cultures I met, that's what really helped fuel my writing and meeting new people, getting different perspectives on life. It really helped me understand like, okay, that makes sense. And it really fueled my writing at the end of the day. Uh, going to these new places I've never been. And uh, I think that was like one of the key factors. And I think, like I said earlier too, uh, staying in tune with the sacraments, that's what I needed to do to keep this writing going. Because when I was in a, a, a say, when I was in a life of sin, I couldn't write. There was just nothing there. But then when I was in tune with the sacraments, I felt like all of these creative ideas were coming out. So I really like that about my novel. And I think that's why uh, I was, that's why all these ideas are coming out right now. <laughs> So, yeah. yeah. I mean, when that grace starts to sort of funnel through you, you know it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It, it's really a beautiful sort of process that happens. Um, years ago, I was, I was, um, I, it was after the earthquake in Haiti. I, I thought to myself, it was about a year later. And I thought, you know, sooner or later, somebody's going to write a children's book about, about it. It might as well be me. <laughs> so I started yeah. for three months. I worked on this story. I diligently worked on this story and I sent it to my publisher at Educavision at the time. And um, they wrote back and said, basically, we hate it. It's horrible. <laughs> 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 so, 
and um, but they said, but try again. And yeah. that made me even more miserable because I didn't really have another story in me. Like that was the one story I had in my head. And um, so I thought, oh, great. Not only, you know, have I failed miserably, but I don't have another story in me. And um, that night as I was falling asleep, I had a dream. And in the dream, there was a storyteller with a drum and he was walking into the ref sort of the um, the earthquake camps in Haiti. And he was patting his drum and he was calling the children and he was saying to them, tell me your story. And I, I saw this whole thing and I pulled myself out of sleep and I said, I got to remember this in the morning. And um, in the morning, I wrote down what I saw in that dream. Um, and that was the book that was published, Heel of the Hand. Oh, my goodness. So that was that was the story. Um, a wow. week later, the ending of the story just, again, just came to me as grace. Um, and, and so two weeks later, I'd worked on the other story for months. Um, two weeks later, I sent the new story that I had, that had come to me in a dream. And my publisher said, we love it. And that wow. Was yeah. So I, I trust, I was slowly learned, trust the grace, you know, just yeah. trust the grace and dreams. You know, I mean, you think of God does work also through our dreams. So. You know, yeah. Well. <laughs> yeah. Listen to your dreams. Yeah. I noticed that a lot. That's such an amazing story because it's so, so relevant. It's like when God comes through and gives you these ideas, it's like, write them down and then you create a really amazing story like you did. So I love that because uh, that's really what I did too. It's like, I had these ideas and one day I was like, okay, I need to write all this. So that's what I did. Just write it, get it down, write it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. And it's sometimes also if an idea doesn't work, um, Put it aside, save it for later. But I tell people, I tell young people, don't throw it out. Don't yeah. throw it out. It may not work in this story, but it might work in the next one. Yeah, yeah. definitely. That's why I am. I have, I think I have some side stories in my novel that uh, it's not in the current novel, but it's just on a, a blank doc I have, and I just wrote it all down because it might work in the next novel. So <laughs> I did the same thing. So I want to talk about that next one because you know, as I was I, yesterday was a very busy day, and I realized I had forty pages left. And I rushed home from mass this morning to finish the 40 pages. And as I was driving home, I was thinking, how's he going to wrap this story up in 40 pages? You know, it's yeah. 400 pages. And all of a sudden, you're going to wrap it up in 40. And all of a sudden, I started. So I started reading this morning to get those. And I got about, you know, 20 pages read. And all of a sudden, I went, he's not wrapping this story yeah. up. <laughs> so tell us about this. This is one of a trilogy, perhaps. Yes. So I envision this definitely being a trilogy, but I could foresee it being almost uh, max. I would hope I can get it all done in seven books, but I can see this being from three to seven books. Uh, right now, I know for sure that the next book, uh, I already have all the ideas written down and I have kind of an outline, which I didn't make an outline for this book, but I did make an outline for the second book and I can see the second book almost being two books. So uh, this is definitely going to be a trilogy. Um, I envision it can be up to seven books. I wouldn't want to go further than that, um, but definitely going to be a multi, a, a big series. And there's going to actually be side books too of side stories because the history of my land dates back very far. And I would, would like to write about that too, because there are some really unique side stories I want to write about. Cool. Cool. So Frank Ravinelli, Pages of the Adair. Journey uh, to say it again. Yeah. Uh, it's pages. It's uh, pages of the Adur. You almost got it. Yep. Okay. <laughs> yep. Journey to Peninsia. Penin Peninsia Throne. You got it. Do you have a title for the next one? Not yet. So I actually thought about that too. When I was, uh, so the other day, and I was telling my little brother about this, and I wanted to see if I still have all the, because the, I wanted to write again. I, I was got kind of bored one night. It was a couple of weeks ago and I started writing the prologue to book two. And then I was like, oh my goodness, how did I write 350 pages? Because this is hard, <laughs> but I don't have a title. I have an idea. I don't want to release it yet because the title is going to be um, very unique. And the next book is going to be very powerful. I think even more, I mean, really tragic too, but I, I really uh, envision the next book being pretty long, but I don't have a title. I have an idea of a title, but I wouldn't want to release anything yet for it. Can you show us the cover once more of this one? Yep, of course. Yep, let me know if you can see. That's a good. Yeah, beautiful. And tell us again where we can get it. So right now, 
Uh, you can get it on my website, which is just frankravinelli.com. I envision it being on Amazon uh, starting in January. Um, I used to have a seller central account and I just got to work through it again because I'm not a, a huge fan of selling on Amazon, but I, I have done it. But right now I'm going to be selling it at local bookstores near me. And you can also buy it on my website where I can ship it to you. Wonderful. Thank yep. you. Thank you yep. so much. And us with a prayer. Yes, of course. Um, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Michael, the archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke, rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much. This has been delightful, and hopefully I'll get a chance to speak with you again. Awesome. Thank you for having me. This was a great experience. I'm glad to, to get my novel out there. <laughs> great. Good luck. God bless. Thank you. Bye. Hello, God's Beloved. I'm Annabelle Mosley, author, professor of theology, and host of Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. I invite you to listen in and find inspiration along this sacred journey we're traveling together to make our lives a masterpiece and, with God's grace, become saints. Join me, Annabelle Mosley, for Then Sings My Soul and Destination Sainthood on WCAT Radio. God bless you. Remember, you're never alone. God is always with you. Thank you for listening to a production of WCAT Radio. Please join us in our mission of evangelization. And don't forget, love lifts up where knowledge takes flight.